Peter Goodburn is with us for some uh, great looks as usual. Uh, Peter, hey back. Peter, switch on your camera. Okay, here I am. Can you can you see me? Oh, look we at can the see look you. Peter has now. Fantastic. Oh, I love it. Cool guys. All right, so nice to see. How you. have you been with us? Huh? How have you been? Yeah, good actually. Yeah, you look can't good. complain. Life's you good. look good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so let's see what you have on. for us. Yeah, so let, let's look at some charts, Peter. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, you go to the share screen. Yeah, let's have a look, um, see what's and, cooking, huh? Um, yeah, I have some burning questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. For you today. All right. Good burning, All right. I, good burning I, I, questions, right? <laughs> All right, I wanted to start here. Okay, so, uh, you know, I want to acknowledge that you put out that piece in January um, that, you know, called the break, the first break that we had. And then last time you were here, I think it was right around, uh, you guys probably can't see my cursor, but right around the, I think the March or February low. And I said, you know, couldn't this be, um, you know, an ABC and we'd go to new highs. And you said, no, I don't think so, but we could go 46, 4,700 uh, mission mm -hmm. accomplished and turned down from there. So, uh, I guess the next question is this bounce we're getting and maybe a relief rally with uh, yields and um, a lot of bearishness out there. Um, mm -hmm. You're looking for what's going to be uh, the level that it has to turn back down for the uh, bear market scenario to um, continue. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, we'll jump to the very short term picture um, and have a look because yeah, it is quite fascinating. We got to this counter trend rally um, um, just really, uh, what, just before Easter? Well, in fact, back end of last month at 46.31. And what I was really watching for in the S&P, really to affirm the idea that, um, that we're, in a, we're in a sort of a larger decline this year and an unwinding of risk assets and sort of really, a, I think, a pause in the inflation scenario, would be really this uh, late February upswing in the S&P completing yeah. a three wave pattern. Um, and it successfully did so. I mean, if we simply take our standard measurement um, of the zigzag and, and extend wave A to this extreme here, and if I double click, that will produce a, a 61.8 ratio extension ratio for the target right. for this wave C. And you can see it, you know, it's pretty much bang on. And, and then we started to to move downwards after that. And uh, that's been a, a very strong confirmation that um, basically, I suppose, the, the trend is down, downwards. Okay. Does sentiment, I know you're, you know, you really, uh, you have to trust your tools, but does sentiment ever bother you? There, you know, there's talk about the AAII sentiment survey, uh, most bears since 92, mm. most negative since 92. Uh, yeah. In a bear market, does it have as much impact or does it just generate what we're getting right now? Well, uh, I think in a bear market, it gives you pockets of rallies, won't it? Right. I mean, uh, that is excessive. I saw the same numbers, you know, the differential between bulls and bears has, you know, hit that, as you say, that major low there. And it normally produces a good counter trend rally. Uh, well, we have seen a good counter trend rally. I mean, it's OK. I mean. Uh, in relative terms, it's still relatively small to compared to what we saw from late February right. into the March high. But but uh, there is something going on over you know um, here, and uh, I think um, the most important thing really to validate the next downswing was um, this five wave decline here. It's a bit overlapping, so I've drawn it as a diagonal with a couple of boundary lines to emphasise the diagonal. But since then, it's been running up into an expanding flat up here. <clears throat> Had um. A little up, up to 44.66 and then it had a, a little three wave zigzag decline to a slightly lower low we can measure that and uh, and this week <clears throat> yesterday in particular we start getting some yeah. some upside you know some really necessary upside movement for wave c and yeah i think we're coming to completion today probably i mean 45.02 45.20 that should be enough i think we're going to start kicking down so yeah, sentiment does, you know, does play an impact here. And I'm normally very tuned into those. Um, but I think in this particular case, uh, it's a very hard um, 
a very hard uh, talk to convince of a, of a more protracted upswing when you've got this particular pattern sort of unfolding in the short term. Yeah, and you go back to the drawing board back over 4631. It's right there on the chart. For yeah, that's right. For another think, bearish count. Yeah, I mean, we can never be 100% certain about anything in, in, in this game. Uh, we can only deal with probabilities. Right. Um, um, but yeah, it's just a point of which, you know, we can emphasize the fact that if we were somehow miraculously to trade above 4631, you know, the downside momentum's gone. But I, I find it, um, I find that that would be rather fanciful to think in those terms. I mean, rating it as a probability, I would give it probably 10% only at the moment. The, um, you know, I want to go to yields and yen next because uh, people are saying we're actually getting a green <laughs> candle in the bonds today, oh, yeah. Peter, in TLT. And we are getting uh -huh. a little outside day reversal in the 10 year. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to say, if that is a top for a correction, and I, I think uh, I want to know where you're at, okay, mm. Um, mm. that they believe it's going to be bullish for stocks. It takes the pressure off tech higher rates. And I remember talking to you just, you know, I think it's uh, just a Skype call. I don't even know if it was in an interview. And you said, well, Dale, what do you think is going to create a downdraft in in the rates and mm. um i said risk off questioning you know and mm. that's exactly what you think is going to be uh the catalyst for a bond rally and yields to pull back so mm. not mm. many people thinking we could pull back to um 130 uh i think B, B of a is making a big call at 230 today huh. yeah well i think they'd be grateful for something like that I mean, I, I know there's been a, a real, a real sort of inverse squeeze, if you like, on the fact that um, you know the, the the T notes have been sold down so aggressively, <clears throat> and the yields have popped up. And winding the clock back, you know, a month or more, um, I thought that you know we would get to sort of something like just above two percent, and that would be it. Um, and we've had this uh, extra leg in sequence up. And I've been sort of trying to examine that, what that looks like from really August. And this was really important because in this sequence up, uh, there's, a, there's an element of overlap in ways one and four, but that's not visible in the in the T-note futures. Now, you know, you can argue the point. I know there's a lot of Elliott guys out there practicing Elliott wave. who say, wow, OK, even three three pips of, a, of an overlap, that that's negation. Well, it's not really. I mean, look, if you look at us, if you look at hundreds and hundreds of uh, different impulse waves, eventually you'll come to the same conclusion I have. And that is that from occasional points, you're going to get what I call now an Elliott wave kiss. It's not a French kiss. It's a little peck on the cheek either side and then and then it off it goes again. And this happens. And what you've got to do in order in those circumstances where there's a bit of overlap is to check. Um, if you're looking at a futures market, check the underlying cash market to see if it's duplicated or or even look at something that's highly correlated, maybe two or three other things which are highly correlated, and just check them out. I did this um, on the T-Note Futures. Um, I'm just going to find it for you here. And uh, found that there was no overlap. Um, and sorry, I'm taking a bit longer. To hear so the that makes, made you um, question the call or reevaluate the call? Yeah, I but mean, base, yeah, it did, because I think that although there's overlap from August in that upswing in the yield, there isn't really in the futures here. And this is um, really um, quite an extraordinary fifth wave. Now, this is an extended fifth wave if we count down one, two, three, four, five. But critically, there's no overlap. You see, wave one was yeah. here at 129, right. really 130 around, and uh, this is 129 figure. So, yeah, I've uh, come to the conclusion that... Um, We've got five waves up here, um, and and that sort of also is um, a good point to compare with maybe the five-year yield, which doesn't overlap. So I'm quite satisfied that that's okay. Now uh, we have got overlap in the bigger picture, you know, going back to the pandemic low here as it, it evolves to the upside. And there's a, there's an element of overlap here. Well, not just a, a small element. I think this is undisputably uh, an overlap of wave one. So. I think this has cornered itself into a diagonal pattern, and um, and that would open up the um, the way for a good risk off, as you said in the opening remarks here, um, for um, a period of time over the next several months, if not into year end, where the yields start to pull back, 
you know, we're going to get a, a peak in the in the uh, in the CPI. I think um, when I last looked at the CPI, there was a very nice five wave upswing pattern in that economic data point from the pandemic low. So I think given that we're what pushing up, at, what were we last on the CPI? The headline number was about 7.9, wasn't it? Steve Dale? would know. He tattoos them in his arm. Okay. I thought Steve, it was... Steve, you there? Oh, maybe he's, maybe okay. he's gone for lunch break. Okay. But, um, yes, sorry. What was the question? Uh, what was the US CPI headline number last? Was it 7.9? The last one we just got. Yeah. Eight and a half percent, eight point six, half. something like that. Yeah. Oh, eight point six. That's right. Sorry. Yeah, eight point six. Well, there's a very nice five wave advance there from the pandemic low. So if you're able to to get a, a chart up on that, um, okay. a real time chart, you can see it. So I think that um, almost certainly we're going to get some risk off here, and uh, um, I think that's going to have an impact on the dollar as well. Um, and actually, the dollar yen, which is, I know, the next thing you wanted to look at, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, let me ask you this, Peter. Uh, you know, um, you know, wave practicing Elliot um, is, um, you know, there's so many ways that people skin the cat and in Elliot. But you know what? Something that just happened in Russia, uh, you didn't think they would invade. You're not the only one. Um, uh, at times, could there be just global events that um, distort, magnify, um, accelerate uh, certain market moves that ordinarily wouldn't, uh, but uh, the largest uh, war on, in Europe uh, in 70 years could be an event like that, that it just overwhelms most technical methodologies? I love this subject. I mean, you're you're hitting onto a subject I love to talk about, um, but you've got to be fairly open-minded. Um, you know, when I was when I started my career in, in doing Elliott waves, and uh, and, I, and I'm talking about you know, 35 or plus more years ago, I, I was a bit of a purist, you know, and uh, I really thought that all of the Elliott wave patterns. Um, irrespective of some exogenous event or geopolitical event, you know, would, would be able to be predicted. In fact, quite the opposite, you know, you should be able to almost, if you can forecast it, forecast those geopolitical events or exogenous events ahead of time. But I have in, in, in the last decade or more, I've come to the point that, yeah, I see things a bit differently to that. I think that things can be distorted at certain junction points um, I've I've seen some of the best Elliott wave patterns that should be basically unbreakable, um, impenetrable, um, suddenly go haywire and off at a tangent because of some exogenous or, or some piece of um, geopolitical news. And um, I've seen this, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but enough for me to be convinced that my original perception back in the 80s was wrong, that there are occasions where things can be changed. And if you look at it from a philosophical point of view, um, and you understand in this day and age that energy and matter is interchangeable. So, okay, we can go back to Einstein's theory on this, E equals MC squared, energy and matter, E and M. Uh, these things are interchangeable. And what scientists haven't really, have, um, really got to grips with at the moment is that at the sub, sub um, a quantum level, the subquantum level, they can't understand why two different particles are attracted to each other. And if you walk into a room and with those two particles almost static, that suddenly they start interacting with you as well. Um, this is all about um, the microcosm affecting the macrocosm and, and, its, and its manifestation um, through a thought process. What I'm trying to say is that if there's enough people thinking about a certain thing, you're going to get that manifesting into a certain way and direction. And it's almost as if the universe sometimes has these waiting rooms. Um, and it's a waiting room for something to happen where the road splits into different ways. And depending on the higher consciousness of, of, um, of maybe it can be a, it could be an individual um, if he's got enough power on that, or it could be a conglomerate of 
of individuals like the financial yep. markets. Right. You could affect that change at certain junction points. Um, yeah, okay, I won't go into more details on that, but I do believe that that could happen. Um, if the question in then is, is dollar yen under one of those situations? No, I don't think so. I think um, that happened certainly in terms of the Russian situation, because I had some Elliott patterns before Russia invaded Ukraine, which looked as if they wouldn't. And that's where my basis of opinion came from. But I do okay. believe that since then, um, that was one of those pathways of exogenous events where there was a trigger point and it took it decided to take a different event. But I think that those things, when they happen, they're pretty rare. You know, you by the time you finish your career, you'll be able to count them on on on, on just your hands, the fingers on okay. your hands. All right. So, uh, often. OK, so uh, besides risk off and, uh, you know, uh, let's go to the end. Um, I know it was a monster that surprised me. Um, so uh, I have no idea where we're at. And, you know, we have some guys here that, uh, you know, were on desks and uh, lived in Japan and wow. Okay. Well, I thought, I thought I'd uh, show you a chart, um, which yeah. um, I had from uh, this chart was basically at the pandemic low yeah. when we were trading at 101.18. And, and, you know, don't forget that the month before, in February, you're at 112, and suddenly yeah. you're at 101. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're going to, you know, when you see something like that, the mind immediately starts to think in terms of extrapolation. Yeah. And, and of course, this is, this is really where you get major directional changes because, you know, if you've got, you know, an, an extreme sort of situation like that, you know, basically, um, more often than not, you're in a buying opportunity, which it turned out to be. We published this chart on the 11th of March, just as that low occurred. And we said, right, we're in a new uptrend now. We're, we're going to complete this zigzag. We're going up, you know, to 121.80. I used the, the very smallest Fibonacci ratio in order to get that. I didn't want to frighten too many people, but I mean, that was frightening enough. When I presented that to a lot of our institutional clients, they said, are you really crazy? Some of them have known these long range forecasts before, so they didn't actually say it, but I could hear them thinking, <laughs> but, but you're right. I mean, look, that's a huge move up and we're describing a zigzag. Well, it turns out that we weren't, we didn't need to be so conservative using a 14.58 minimum Fibonacci extension ratio. We could have been braver still and used the 61.8 or the 38% number here. The 38 number was at 127 and the 61.8 is coming in at 13270. Well, I'm not so certain we're going to get that high, but um, we have broken this high, basically, um, going back to the 2015 high. And that means that this same zigzag pattern is unfolding as wave B of an expanding flat. So that means at some point we're going to get this big five wave decline over the next several years down like this. And that's itself going to be interesting because we are talking about a dollar crisis. Exactly. A dollar crisis. Yes, this is this is all very, very familiar territory. And, you know, in our annual reports, we've got a very long term dollar decline basis, the 7.8 year cycle coming down. It's going to basically drop the dollar by about 45 percent. And just recently, I've just updated um, a dollar chart, which. Um, uh, no, sorry, that's gold. Um, and and the dollar is well extended a little yeah. further than original thought. Right. Yeah, I thought, that, um, I mean, OK, winding back the clock to January 21, when the dollar was trading at 88 something. Um, we um, I thought, right, we'll get back to wave four proceeding. So from an Elliott yeah. perspective, you always work with the minimum criteria to the upside. And wave right. four was about a 50 percent correction. But we've done 76 um, yeah. percent. I mean, OK, and that has been elongated and prolonged, mainly because, of course, we've got these rising inflation pressures, which weren't evident um, pre-COVID, um, not in the, in the basic materials. Don't forget that we had price inflation going back to the financial crisis lows when the financial crisis bottomed and we had commodity prices surging higher. Yeah, sure. Um, in, the, in the aftermath of that. Yeah. But we never got um, underlying um inflation in things like foods and services because because basically the economy was 
flooded with those. Um, and basically, you didn't need to raise prices. It's only after COVID that you've had price inflation as we know it. Why is that? Why, why after COVID? Well, because for one big reason. First of all, OK, um, you've had you've got a lot less people trading now as they were before. I mean, a lot of people went bankrupt in the gov these governments have made a lot of people bankrupt. It's criminal through COVID lockdowns and the death rates through COVID, the five year aggregate death rates are no different after COVID than they were before. And you can look up Andrew Kaufman on Google and, and check his uh, statistics out for that. He's got them countrywide. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. So there's less people around. You can stick up your prices and nobody, nobody can complain because either you want it or you don't. If you don't pay the price, go away. That's their attitude a lot of the time, especially in big industry, unfortunately. So prices are going up. I mean, oil prices, why didn't you see headline inflation? As Steve said, 8.6% back in 2008 when oil initially traded up to $134. Why? Why not then? Why now? Think Why? of it that way. Why? Why didn't we see it back then? Well, because there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, competition at that point. It's only yeah. because post-COVID, there's a lot less people around trading. I mean, when I say trading, I mean um, manufacturing goods, um at the you know competitive competition has 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 yeah. been lessened yes uh, we went from uh we went from supporting uh a massive unemployment situation here in the u.s to having labor shortages well that too and um and that that also uh contributes to the to the problem i've got friends who are who are manufacturing uh, a lot of goods in china still and, um, and, and sort of importing them into, into the US and Europe, both. Um, and we're talking about, you know, medium-sized companies, you know, 100 million plus. And, you know, they've said, we haven't, we haven't put up our prices for our end products to our wholesalers uh, for 15 years, but we have done post-COVID. And they've gone up like 50, 60%. And people yeah. are still buying them. They don't like it, but they're still buying it. Yeah, well, it, uh, a lot of people say that we had you know, supply chain disruption. I think we have supply chain destruction. Yes. And it's never going to come back to the way it was, uh, just in time, uh, warehousing. And so, you know, that's going to take years to reconstruct. Yeah. So are we, you know, we, we can have shortages of everything and what you're talking about in commodities is just basically a correction. Yeah, basically a correction. Yeah, I mean it could be quite severe, um, and uh, and then afterwards we go up again, um, which is the final phase of what I call my inflation pop cycle. Because you know that theoretically started back in the financial crisis lows when central banks first started to invent the idea of quantitative easing. Okay. Um, so the the initial big commodity surge, if you go and look at something like copper, for example, um, well we can have a quick look. Um, and the big surge that followed the financial crisis uh, lows was really the first phase of the inflation pop. And then we had a regression period for five years with the lows in, in uh, 2016, which I call the grand resynchronization um, period at that time, because basically at that time, um, <clears throat> we came down here in 2016, which was a five year disparative movement. To, to stock markets, you know, the S&P was trending up during that time. Um, but the, the two patterns which represent the inflation pop, the final phase of the secular bull market from the financial crisis lows, are very different for stock markets to commodities. Commodities are all developing into zigzags. Here, good example for copper prices, A, B down and C up. Um, for stock markets, they're all evolving into five wave expanding impulse patterns with a few exceptions. Uh, here I'm referring to you know some of the some of the things that uh, our viewers today will be looking at and trading at, like the S&P and the Dow and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so uh, you've got these very two distinct patterns, and it was necessary for commodities to have this breakdown and dis and this uh, disparative negative correlation for five years because how do you otherwise overlay a five wave expanding impulse pattern to a zigzag three wave pattern? 
um, at some stage they're they're not you know they're not fitting together. It's like putting a square block in a round hole or the other way around. It's just not going to work. But so you've got to have this dislocation for a while. And now they've recorrelated at this grand resynchronization nose. And, um, and now they're moving ba basically in rhythm again. So um, generally speaking, if we get a commodity uh, price decline this year, uh, and you know, specifically things like crude oil, energy, base metals, copper, and stuff like that, gasoline, uh, you're going to get the stock markets dropping down as well. Okay. So, I mean, uh, are we in a position for uh, a liquidation break your uh, commodities, stocks, uh, basically uh, you want to be short the, short the board uh, and short the dollar for yeah, the I next think, quarter I, or so. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, the dollar, the dollar looks about done. Um, it's been, as you said earlier, a, a very big, steep sort of uh, correction. Um, but we had a very similar steep correction, uh, winding the clock back. Pre-COVID, yeah, absolutely. The, the COVID, the COVID high. Uh, let's see if we've got that here. Um, the COVID, the COVID high, up here at one hundred two ninety nine was a very steep correction to this preceding five wave decline, and we've got sort of a similar function going on here as well. Okay. So, um, um, I think if we get um, the dollar turning down, because don't forget this big strength and push up in the dollar was all about rising inflation pressures. If those inflation pressures start to ease off, if the perception suddenly switches around and changes, the dollar's going to dive. Um, we're going to see a, a complete um, uh, decline across the dollar, um, you know, against most currencies. Um, that means ten-year yields will start to correct to the downside, um, and it means that you know dollar yen is going to suddenly do a reverse. I mean, don't forget Bank of Japan. I mean, if you want to short the yen right now, you're going to be taking on the Bank of Japan in the next few days, probably. Do you want to do you're that? You're looking for solo intervention. I, I would think so. I think you these don't guys think won't they have need any... a plaza. They, they might need a plaza accord for it to be effective. But uh, what do you think? More than them, they need the U.S. to coordinate with them, don't you think? Well, were they did they do that in the past? Um, no. Well, plaza, why would they need it now? Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Um, okay. But, but anyway, yeah, I think um, yeah. The, then you've got the yen topping out now, which is which is great from the pattern perspective. I mean, I mean that's there's nothing extraordinary about that. And um, and you know when you look at things like gasoline prices, which came top of the list in the energy contracts for last year, um, gasoline has topped out with crude oil already. Um, I think I've got a gasoline chart here. Yeah, so gasoline topped out in March at three eighty eighty nine. Yeah. And, and that one's getting poised ready for a very big uh, decline. So, you know, like oil prices. So, um, no, I think we've already got, to some extent, those inflation tools, which had really driven up that uh, CPI so strongly in the last 12 months. Uh, some of those, you know, particularly the energy um, uh, sector, they're all topping out. So, um, you know, it's only natural gas that could do a little bit more, but that's unique yeah. to Europe. Well, you know, you know, I could already hear what's going to be going on here in the summer, late summer and fall, is that Jerome Powell's going to say that we see, we did it, and Joe Biden's going to be saying, yeah, we have, uh, you know, lower gas prices and uh, their polls are in the toilet. Uh, you know, people are really <laughs> angry at Powell, and uh, they could say, see, I told you so. Well, I think there might be some element of that. I mean. Um... The, 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 the odd thing that's going on really does enter into around the fixed income markets at the moment because, you know, you've got um, central banks, you know, going through their quantitative tightening program now, just at the time when, you know, there's a potential downturn, you know, if, you know, being shown up in the, in the long dated yields, not the short dated, yeah. but the long dated yields and things like, you know, energy prices. So, you know, um, it's, a, it's a bit strange. They're going in one direction up while the yeah. market's probably going to come down. And they're going in opposite directions. So you've got to say that at the moment, okay, people are extrapolating again, which is a dangerous thing to do this late in the in this in the trend. Um, and the two-year yield is likely to take a hit to the downside somewhere soon below three percent. I mean, I mean, three percent is a very big number on the on the uh, uh, on the U.S. ten-year yields because we go back to 2018 for that high. And, yeah, I saw and, that. And, 
And, you know, that's, um, you know, that if you go taper, to taper, taper tantrum. Yeah, exactly. And look, here's, here's, here's close to 3% here, 29940 yeah. on the two year yield. Are you telling me that this exponential rise is going to keep going on forever? Absolutely not. I've never seen one that, yeah. that I've never seen. That is, that is rarer than a dodo. <laughs> you know what? You're mm. rare. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I really, Peter, I, you opened my eyes to some things, and uh, you know I like the way you would adjust to when things don't work out exactly to plan, and uh, you you really put your uh, thesis and narrative through the acid test, and uh, I appreciate you coming here, and you know the narrative of a dollar peak. You want to just show the euro, and then your website, and we're running out of time. Um, you know, and wouldn't it be classic that uh, the euro bottomed on the most dovish ECB meeting possible? Uh, so far, we haven't been able to take out Thursday's low. No, I mean, this is the big number, 106.35. It shouldn't really break that. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if we're going to move up and this is a correction, it's going to have to do it right now. So, yeah. you know, you won't have to wait too long. And to be honest, if you haven't already got a position and you're fairly neutral on this, you know, you might want to wait a bit and pick it up later because, you know, you won't have a. But I mean, there's um, I, I genuinely think that this looks really good. I was looking at Euro Swiss earlier today. We haven't got time for that now because I'm going to give you my PR campaign now. But um, the Euro Swiss has had a fantastic um, five wave declining sequence. Well, while I'm telling you, I might be able to show it to you. Um, and um, and that shows the euro strength coming in back in. So and EG, um, euro pound did not make a new low with euro. On yeah, Thursday. yeah, exactly. This is the euro Swiss. Look at this decline from yeah. from back end of last year, five waves down. Look, I mean, this is fantastic. There's going to be a really big uptick in the euro. So I mean, we're, if you're going to see that against the Swiss franc, and the Swiss franc is a safe haven currency, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of the markets? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all right. Look. Um, yeah. Um, All right. Show, show your website, Peter, so that uh, <laughs> people, if people want uh, more details about it, uh, where they go to subscribe and uh, follow you. Well, thanks, uh, Dale. Um, yeah. If anybody's tuning in today and would like to learn a little bit more about Elliott Wave, um, our, our weekly report, um, actually, it's bi weekly. We put out a report twice, uh, two reports per week. Uh, it's called the Elliott Wave Compass. If you just go to wavetrack.com uh, and um, if you take a look um, and look at um, uh, subscriptions, so you can mouse over here. And the first one, first product to subscribe to is the Elliott Wave Compass Report. It's 39 bucks a month. And uh, you can actually choose different uh, time periods if you want to. And uh, there's, no, there's no auto renewal on this. So you won't have to sweat if you give you know, put through a transaction and want to see how we're doing uh, to get a feel for what we're doing. Uh, you won't have to sweat thinking oh, I've got to cancel because it will just naturally expire. It's up to you to renew it. Um, and um, I can promise you we'll put in some some very interesting tutorial uh, about how we measure up and use our Fibonacci tools. So, yeah, we'd welcome anybody that's um, that hasn't already experienced uh, our reports to come in and and join us. And uh, and for those of you uh, on Twitter. I actually got my Twitter handle ready today. Um, and uh, nice. well, at least I yeah. thought it was. Um, but you can just um, type in uh, uh, WayTrack or Twitter. And here's our handle. And uh, follow us there. We've got some good information on there too. Thank you, Peter, for you being here and your giving spirit, sharing your, your stuff. And uh, uh, it was great to hear an update. <laughs> great, Dale. Really well, yeah, as always, it's great fun to be with you guys. And uh, um, if any of the thank you, Peter. Also, nice to have you. Great, Steve. Yeah, it's great to see you too, and all the best to you. And uh, good luck um, for the coming week. All right, Peter. Everyone, Peter Goodburn. You could follow him at uh, right there at his Twitter. There you go at Elliot Wave underscore WTI. Peter, have a great week. I'll be talking to you soon, my trading warrior brother. Thanks, Dale. And really appreciate the contrarian view to what everyone else is saying. Gives uh, our community some balance, and we appreciate it. All the best. 
All right. So that's a wrap, everybody. Uh, seven minutes. You can get uh, into the room with the guys on the morning edge. And we'll see every, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good hunting. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And uh, glad to see the community interacting today. See you, Sinatra. Okay, Hussein. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Laura. Adios, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you, Steve. Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.